Good morning, everybody. I'm here to talk a bit about what it is to make machines that, she, that see. I'm going to preface that, first of all, by explaining, well, you know, what is vision? How does our own brain do it? And then I'll talk about some of the issues that are involved in terms of making a machine that can do something anyway related to what our own visual capabilities are and what the uses and so on of that kind of technology might be. So basically, our visual system really started to evolve around 700 million years ago. There was a phase of the Earth's history called the Ice Ball Earth. Uh, life was, uh, had become almost uh, eliminated and was re restricted to the areas around geothermal vents. Uh, very simple animals, and over the following uh, 100 million years or so, it developed, it developed into the Precambrian, the Cambrian period, and there was an explosion of life forms. But one of the key things to happen during that period was, uh, you can see a, a compound eye from a, uh, an Antarctic krill shown on the, on the left-hand side there, and a protein that is really the key uh, light detection mechanism in all seeing beings. It's a protein called opsin, and at the center of that, there's a, um, a molecule called retinol, and that retinol uh, allows you to, or allows us to see light by essentially reacting to a photon and triggering a nerve that sits nearby. And this, this is basically common to all organisms. It, it emerged, as I said, around 700 million years ago before uh, ourselves, let's say bilateral beings and the class of animals that uh, forms you know, sea anemones and, uh, um, uh, and jellyfish and so on uh, split into two, so a long, long time ago. But this molecule is common. So we have an amazing visual system built into our heads. About 50% of all of our brain, uh, of everything that our brain does is vision processing. Uh, just to give you an idea, we have about 80 billion neurons in our heads and literally tens of trillions of synapses. And it's essentially the combination of that co-located with your eyes allows you to do, to make the visual, uh, to do the visual sensing and then your frontal lobes does uh, do the uh, interpretation of that at a higher level and the decision making. What's different uh, uh, about this is uh, the human brain as a structure for, for doing vision processing is that it's all three dimensional. You can basically connect uh, the neurons in, in pretty much any direction you want and it allows you to get a fantastic amount of density in terms of decision making, all very localized connections and all this is, is you know, fantastic. You know, it's the product of hundreds of millions of years of of evolution, and to give you an idea, about 20 watts total is what a, you know the uh, the energy requirement of a light bulb is what's required to power all of this. So about 10 watts is used for vision processing. Uh, our crude way of of uh, trying to imitate this is using silicon, and silicon is essentially printed sheets of uh, of sandwiches made from silicon and other materials. Uh, so it doesn't really connect in three dimensions. So what we can do compared to what is the product of 100 years of uh, hundreds of millions of years of evolution is very limited. Uh, to give you an idea, if we wanted to, uh, and there are many, there are some very large projects, there's a Blue Brain project at EU level, is trying to duplicate the functionality of the brain in computer simulation using mainframe computers, and you're talking about the order of 10 megawatts uh, being required and an extremely large computer being required to duplicate what we can do. And, that's only notional in that nobody has actually managed to do this yet. Um, there's also a, a, an issue in terms of the amount of vision processing vers versus the frontal lobes. Um, the Neanderth Neanderthals, for instance, had a much larger vi vision processing uh, engine in their, in their heads. And in fact, they had a, a kind of a protrusion at the back of their head uh, called the occipital bun. Um, and it's believed that one of the reasons why uh, um, Neanderthals lost out to anatomically modern humans was they had less in terms of frontal lobe, so less decision making uh, about vision. So there's a fine balance there. And in fact, there's still a difference between people who live at higher latitudes in the Nordic countries and in the Arctic uh, in terms of the uh, size of their vision processing system compared to, uh, to people who live elsewhere. Again, for, that re for the reason that there's low light, so you're visual, you need additional visual acuity. 
So if we want to try and duplicate that in, in a computer, which is effectively the business that I'm involved in, essentially you have to kind of build a little mathematical model that you build by training, and you need to step that over an image because we don't have you know, 80 billion processors to do this, so you have to sequentially do it. So you do it basically stepping across the image left to right in terms of, uh, in terms of columns and then down the rows. And then you have to do that for each individual scale because you can see there in the background, there's a whole lot of runners and people will appear at different scales. You know, there'll be different numbers of pixels high. To, to give you an idea, if you try to, try to do this on a standard HD TV image, it takes about 500 million, so half a trillion operations to do that on one frame. And our visual system processes it somewhere between 25 and 30 frames per second. So it's an absolutely massive amount of computing power is required. And to get that into a form factor that you can use and you can hold in your hand is also a challenge because what you can safe, safely dissipate in a mobile phone or handset or tablet uh, without it feeling physically uncomfortable to handle is around about three or four watts. So you probably have about a watt to play with as opposed to the 10 watts uh, that you have in your brain. And it's also very limited, as I mentioned, in terms of the connectivity that you can achieve. So best we can do here is really a crude approximation um, of, what a, of what a human being can do. Uh, there are many people now talking about, well, you know, being able to connect all of these cameras and drones and other devices to the cloud. Uh, and the picture that I have here in the background is essentially one of the Milky Way. And there are people talking about, let's say, in the next 10 to 20 years, about one trillion devices being connected uh, you know, into the Internet of Things. To give you an idea there, in the Milky Way, there are 300 billion. So the scale of this thing is absolutely massive. One of the things I wanted to explain to you today is what the challenges are here, because there are people like the NSA and GCHQ that are already trying to vacuum up lots of personal data about us. And you know, they, uh, the, uh, let's say, Uber AI intelligence that people are, some people are talking about hasn't emerged, even though there's enormous amounts of data being, uh, being uh, hoovered up from all of our devices. And you know, there are some fundamental challenges involved that don't really get talked about, and I want to talk about some of them. So essentially, the pyramid that most of these people are following and the large internet companies would follow suit is that you have sensors at the very base, and that you, know, you wirelessly or otherwise communicate this data up through a series of different levels to some, side of, some sort of uh, AI that sits in the cloud uh, and provides you useful services with your data, or if it's in the case of GCHQ or NSA, it basically provides you supposedly with intelligence about people. So the, the fact is that there are many issues to do with this uh, that prevent it from scaling. And they're very, uh, you know, you can actually do a, a lot of sensing at a very simple level. The next slide I have here basically shows pretty much the most sim simple brain that exists in, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the scientific experience. And it's a, it's a small worm that's used to, to do a lot of brain research. It has about 308 neurons and about 8,000 synapses. So literally many, many orders of magnitude smaller. But this worm contains opsins, and it has the cap capability to uh, detect light, and it also has many other sensors, and it can, uh, it, even with that t few tiny neurons, it can, it can, uh, uh, can ex exhibit a huge number of useful behaviors. And I guess this is the premise that we're operating off, is that you can, you can, do, you can do very complex behavior, even with a relatively crude machine that we can make uh, you know, in the, let's say, 50 years that we've been trying to make silicon chips, not in the, compared with the hundreds of millions of years that our own brain has had to evolve. So if you try and connect everything with the cloud, there are fundam fundamental issues of scale. Those issues of scale have to do with, you know, the amount of bandwidth that you need uh, in terms of internet connectivity to get the data up there. And the way we envisage uh, this working uh, well and being able to provide services, but with caveats in terms of being able to do it at reasonable cost, at reasonable power, and maintaining some of your privacy and dignity, um, that you can, you can basically interchange data differently with the cloud. And the fundamental thing is to really do this by processing locally. If you notice in our, in our own uh, skull, you know, the, the sensors, our eyes are co-located with the processor. And we believe this is the model to make uh, vision systems that can do useful things for humans. 
a huge issue, as I pointed out already, is, is power. Uh, you know, if you try and duplicate directly using the technology that we have and probably even the technology that we'll have in 10 years' time or 15 years' time, you're still talking about megawatts of power to, to do what, what the brain can do. And there's a question there as to whether that, that's useful or not. Um, the kind of stage they're, that they're at now with the Blue Brain project at the EU level is they can simulate a piece of a cat's brain that's maybe you know, a thousandth of, uh, of the capability uh, of what our own brain can do. And there's a question ev even as to how, how useful that work uh, um, is in terms of it's not actually doing vision processing or whatever, it's simply uh, exchanging data between the different synapses. The, other issue is connectivity. You know, if you have literally you know, a trillion devices out there, how are you going to connect those to the web? There's a very interesting project was done in the past couple of years at Princeton. And what they did was to connect cars and try and, and synchronize them to the traffic lights in order to save fuel. They were able to do this, and they were able to save about 17%, which is you know, a massive amount of saving just by synchronizing cars so they weren't stopping and starting. Uh, they did this in two ways. One way was in the cloud, and they had to, uh, they had to basically exchange quite a bit of data about per, ca per camera, about uh, 30 kilobytes every, every few seconds. Um, by doing the processing in the actual uh, camera itself in the car, they were able to reduce that by about a thousand times. So there, there, there are huge reasons why you would want to decentralize, because uh, Otherwise, you've got to basically pipe up raw video from all of these devices up to the cloud in order to make useful decisions about it. Um, another issue is latency. If you have a self-driving car or a drone, uh, there's a finite amount of time. I think Google and other providers in the market are probably around the 100 millisecond latency. Um, an awful lot can happen in, uh, in 100 milliseconds if you have a self-driving car that's going at 200 kilometers an hour or even 100 kilometers an hour. You know, somebody could be dead by the time the machine has decided that there's a pedestrian in the way. And in fact, if you look at our own uh, human brains and physiology as a proxy for this, uh, we don't, you know, when we reach out and touch something hot, we don't need to, for the impulse to travel to our brain and consciously have to remove our hand. No, you, know, you, have a, you have reflex, so you have distributed processing again. Uh, this, along the lines that we're talking about here. The other issue is, of course, privacy. And you know, we're very familiar now with what's happened in terms of uh, all of our data uh, being tapped off by people like uh, the NSA and GCHQ directly out of our, out of our internet accounts, or in, in fact, they tap in even, even into undersea cables. So the idea of, not, uh, of having local uh, processing means that you don't then uh, transmit up all of your raw data to the cloud, but rather you're able to extract metadata, so you can extract a descriptor for what something is. It's not, it's not something that allows you to recreate somebody's face, but it tells you, yeah, there's a face there. There's a pedestrian in front of my vehicle. I'm hovering too close to that child with my little uh, toy drone, and you can do something useful about it, and you can, f you can fall over to the cloud in terms of if there's something that locally your processing doesn't allow you to do. Uh, you can you can basically do that in uh, in the cloud where uh, to give you more scale where you requ where you require it. So I'm not saying don't use the cloud for computer vision, but it's it should be used in synergy and it should be used to provide additional capabilities beyond the immediate uh, timely ones that you need locally. So I guess if if uh, I want to, you to go away uh, today with something, it's really an appreciation that uh, you know. Certainly from, from my point of view, super AIs and that can recognize everything and control your life. There's no uh, pre uh, uh, reason, I think, for these to be able to exist given the evolution of the technology uh, in, the, in the next probably 10 or 20 years. Maybe beyond that, things will be different. Um, but there's no reason to uh, believe that, you know, we'll be, that the machines will take over. Um, but we can still make machines that can usefully enhance our lives by uh, making cars safer, by detecting pedestrians, or if people are using drones outside, that they don't drop on somebody, you know, a couple of kilos doesn't drop some, on somebody's head, head and seriously injure them, uh, or that we can have cameras that can make sense of our pictures and maybe uh, create albums for us and so on usefully. All of this is possible, and it's all by kind of a harmonious uh, um, melding of you know, local processing uh, that keeps things overall low, low power and usable within a personal context that you know, applies the technology that we have intelligently 
reducing the amount of computation and uh, is um, also, uh, let's say, in, from an overall privacy point of view, gives us the privacy uh, that we want and doesn't require a massive change in terms of the amount of infrastructure that goes out there and, uh, let's say, the maybe million times higher processing power that would be required to do the same thing in the cloud. Thank you.